Welcome to the Plugged In Podcast by Sweetwater. I'm your host, Mitch Gallagher. We've got something very special for you today because for this episode of the Plugged In Podcast, we're sitting down with the legendary bassist, composer, and producer, Marcus Miller. A multiple Grammy winner, Marcus has brought his unique blend of jazz, funk, fusion, soul, and more to artists as diverse as Bill Withers, Eric Clapton, Elton John, Brian Ferry, Wayne Shorter, and of course, Miles Davis. And then there's his successful solo albums and tours as well. Marcus is also a successful film composer. He hosts two weekly radio shows and much, much more, including his popular line of signature basses that he launched through Sire. In this interview, we'll be talking about Marcus's history, we'll dig deep into bass playing and music, and of course, we'll be chatting about his Sire signature basses. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Plugged In Podcast by Sweetwater. Settle in and let's get started. Marcus, great to have you back here at Sweetwater with us. Man, it's nice to be here. This place is incredible, man. I was I was here about 10 years ago, and it was it was sweet then. Yeah, right. <laughs> and now it's even more sweet, man. It's just humongo. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, you walk into this place, and, you know, you walk in not needing anything, and you walk out having bought stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how it goes. That's you the know? power of Sweetwater. Right? Exactly. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're super glad to have you here. And Sire, uh, Sire Guitars brought you in because of the uh, the basses that you're, you're doing with them. Yeah, you know, uh, Sire is um, headed up by... Kyle uh, from South Korea and a good friend of mine, great bass player Andre Berry, introduced us, and we uh, we met in uh, Japan. I was playing in Osaka, and Kyle and Mickey flew over from Seoul, Korea, mm-hmm. and they you know they pitched me. They said, "Hey man, we make these quality basses. We're well known in Korea, and we want to expand, you know, around the world. People know you. People know your sound. You'd be a great guy to do business with. We're just." Uh, you know, presenting you with a student model base. It's going to be very inexpensive, about $300, $350. And the quality is going to be really, really good. I think you're really going to be surprised by the quality. That's what they told me. And I said, sure, sure, I hear that all the time. <laughs> right. But they presented me with the base. And I go, ooh, this thing is kind of kind of nice, you know, especially for the price that they're talking about. And it'd be nice to be maybe connected with something like this. I sent the bass over to my uh, business partner, Harold Good, who's also a bass player. And he said, man, if they're selling it for the price that you say, this is going to be a game changer. You know, so they made a deal and I made some suggestions. You know, I I realize I have to be careful with the suggestions that I make in an offhanded way because they take everything I say really seriously. (laughs) You know, oh, man, I wonder if I wonder what a 60s neck would would feel like and all of a sudden (laughs) the next bass they send you has a 60s neck and (laughs) all the little things that i said you know not you know it's just off the top of my head right they took it serious so we got down to it and came up with a model uh that i was really happy with the the preamp Mm -hmm. um it came with a preamp and um i would make suggestions about the frequencies that the preamp affected you know like let's not make the low end too low nobody's going to use it like that you know it just gets in the way, uh, but here's a better frequency that you could use, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we released it. Fender said, hey, this thing is going to be really big. You're probably going to have to leave Fender. And, uh, you know, we're still on great terms with Fender. But I said, yeah, I'd like to try something new. So put it out. For a year, it was kind of like, a, you know, hit or miss. Yep. And then the thing just caught fire, you know. And the thing that I think helped it catch fire was that um, although Kyle – didn't spend any money on advertising, no money at all. He put that money into the quality of the bass. So there's a there's a machine that uh, levels out your frets. It just sweeps across the neck and just kind of files to make sure the frets are even. And you know each uh, journey across the neck costs money. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And you know in order to make the basses affordable, you know you would think that they just do one sweep across the neck. But no, man, they go fret one, fret zero, fret one, two, fret one, fret three, fret two. You know, back and forth, back and forth to make sure that when you pick up the bass out of the case, it's ready to go. Right. And uh, he said he'd rather put the money into the quality than into advertising. And instead of spending money on advertising, he just used bass players as the advertisement. He just said, let's give the basses to bass players, put it in their hands. And they'll do the advertising for us. And that's ex- absolutely exactly what happened. Yeah. You know, people just started talking about it, and the thing just took off. I mean, it took off. It's pretty crazy, pretty uh, 
pretty unexpected. Yeah, right. So tell us what you look for in a bass. If you pick up a bass, how do you know this one's going to work for Marcus? You know what I do, man. I hit that E string. <laughs> I hit it hard and see if the sun comes out, you yeah. know? <laughs> and if the sun comes out, then that's a, that's a good start, you know? And then you look for uh, uh, solidity. You look for a solid feel with the bass, with the neck, with the body. Um, a lot of bass players um, are looking for a bass that's light, right? right? They're doing gigs all night, you know, and they don't want it to take a toll. But for me, you know, I don't want to go too light. You know what I mean? Because I really believe that the weight of the bass does something to the sound. You know, it gives the sound a little bit of heft. Um, so I look for that. I look for a good, good uh, weight to the body. Look for evenness. You know, you don't want notes jumping out. And uh, and look for tone. You know, I'm a. Uh, I start off as a session musician, so recording was everything. You know, I lived in the studio from eight in the morning till midnight. You know, in the studio with headphones on. You know. And when you play with headphones on all day for 10, 15 years, you really get in tune with your sound. Right. You know, nothing gets, you can't get away with anything. So for me, it's really important to hear uh, that the bass has a, a evenness, the intonation is good. Uh, the frets are not buzzing too much, although I do like a little bit of buzz that lets people know that you're digging in. You know what I mean? But, yeah. you know, all these things um, that are important. That maybe if you just do gigs, you're not paying so much attention to because your amp does a lot of work for you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, with studio stuff, especially when I was coming through, no amps for bass players, you know. The engineers took the basses direct, you know, and uh, so you had to have the sound in your hands and in your instrument. The amp wasn't going to cover up anything. Now, of course, the engineer was probably doing stuff in the studio, sure. you know, in the control room. But you had to present him with a, a good sound. So that's what I was looking for in the sire. And proof of that is that if you go in a lot of studios these days, you know how every studio has a, a bass, you know, it has a drum set in the back if you need that, has a piano. And if it has a bass, a lot of times now it's a sire it's bass. It's a sire, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, man, they're super cool instruments, and we're so glad to have them and you here at, at Sweetwater. It's a fantastic partnership. Oh, yes, man. We, we're having a good time here uh, trying not to spend too much money. <laughs> <laughs> that's the challenge you right? know what like for all musicians it doesn't matter like how long you've been doing it there's nothing like a music store you right. know it just brings you back to your childhood man and it's an exciting thing yeah yeah well that, that's so cool so uh, a couple of years ago right before the pandemic your uh, most recent album came out Laid Black mm -hmm. and uh, then the pandemic hit and you were in a I'd say a little different position than many people because you kind of have two different thrusts to mm -hmm. your career. You've got the film composing, and then you've also got the your your artist yeah. side of it. Yeah, exactly. I started composing films back in the late 80s. Uh, I did one for Miles. You know, uh, somebody had called him to do a film, uh, and they had, they had put temporary music in the film. Yeah. And the temporary music they used was Miles' Sketches of Spain. So then they called Miles and said, hey, can you provide some original music for this film? And Miles said, yeah, here's the number you call. <laughs> and he <laughs> gave him my number, you know. So I got kind of thrown into it. Right. But it was cool. The album is called Siesta, and that was kind of the first major thing I did. But then um, Reginald Hudlin, who's a, he's a very well-known film director now, and he's a producer. He produced Django. He did um, Eddie Murphy's Boomerang. He did Thurgood Marshall movie that came out a few years ago. Uh, he produced the Oscars. He's produced the Emmys. He's just doing all sorts of incredible things. But uh, when he just come out of film school, he called me mm -hmm. and said, hey, I just finished. I'm getting ready to do my first film. And uh, it's going to be put out by this new film company called New Line Cinema. And I'd like you to do the music. I said, but I don't really do a lot of movies. He said, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. He was already a fan of the stuff that I had done already. So, man, you know, I, I hit or missed my way through the first movie. You know, right. tried this, tried that. He said, that works. That absolutely doesn't work over there. <laughs> <laughs> and we got into it. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I've been working for him. And then, you know, we did Boomerang. We did Kid in Play's House Party. And then from there, you know, I started getting calls from a lot of different people. You know, so did a lot of films for um, a company called Screen Gems. Mm -hmm. We did uh, Two Can Play That Game and This Christmas that featured Chris Brown, I've done movies for Sam Jackson, for 
for Morris Chestnut, for, you know, LL Cool J, all sorts of people. So it's kind of like my day gig, especially when my wife and I, we have four kids. And when they were young, it was cool to kind of be able to stay home. Yeah. You know, and work, work from home. Uh, so that's like the dual track. You know, I do a bunch of things. You know, I have a radio show that comes on Sirius XM every uh, Sunday evening and, uh, you know, producing other artists myself. But I've always been that dude, you know, from from New York. I guess I'm a true New Yorker because I always had five things happening at the same always, time. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Jazz cruises and... Uh, Hosting jazz cruises, yeah. exactly. <laughs> man, we... Uh, man, one time I was on... I was on a Luther... No, it was an Aretha Franklin record date, and Luther Vandross was producing, and I had a gig with Miles that night, and man, I was like, man, I gotta, we gotta get this thing done, because right. I gotta get out of here, I gotta get to the airport and fly out to Connecticut, and uh, I barely made the show, man, and, and I tried to, I tr the band was walking onto the stage, and I tried to ease into the back of the line like I had been there all along. <laughs> Didn't work, man. Miles was, <laughs> Miles was looking at me with that scowl. I said, "Okay, okay, that won't happen again." <laughs> but that was just a, you know, a, a kind of indicative of what my life was like, man. I was just doing a lot of things at the same time, and I've always wanted to do that. So, to get back to your question about the pandemic, yeah, I have been um, doing gigs with my band touring all over the world, but that stopped, of course, like it stopped for everybody. So I got even deeper into doing film and TV, mm -hmm. and I did. Um, I did a film for the Thurgood Marshall uh, story, which is a beautiful film. Um, I did a movie called Safety, which is about a student athlete at Clemson University who had to take care of his 11-year-old little brother at the same time because mom was sick. Did the Sidney Poitier documentary that just came out. Just finished one for Willie Mays, which is pretty awesome. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So I was doing that kind of stuff. And now that uh, we're back on the road, just finished six weeks in Europe. And getting back to it. So, um, you know, just trying to balance all these things. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be uh, quite a balancing act. Uh, we were talking earlier, you mentioned uh, beginning of this next year, you'll be heading in to uh, work on your next album and yes. uh, and you're touring till then, balancing all that and having time to write Yeah, and to, to work on things has to be a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge. You know, you uh, I'll, t I'll give you an example. 15 years ago, in order to do movie work and tour at the same time, I had two anvil cases that were five feet high. And in one case was a super high-end VHS tape player mm -hmm. to play the movie, right? I had uh, synth modules, like those old rolling modules that you used to use. Uh, right. And I had a, a case for the tapes. And then I had a sampler, the, the emulator samplers and all sorts of stuff, two anvil cases. And right now, in my backpack, <laughs> have the same thing, right? I have the, I have four times the capability right, right. in my backpack right now with my laptop and a little drive. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, it's tough, but the technology is making it much easier. Right. So how do you find inspiration? It's it's got to be uh, you know constantly working on new things. And what what do you look for to to drive your creativity? Man, it's just, all you got to do is keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. Mm -hmm. You know this stuff to inspire you all the time, you know, and, uh, you know, people give you like really obvious examples, like, you know, they hear an ambulance going by or being on the subway in New York and hearing rhythms, but, you know, just, um, you know, sitting in the hotel, you know, listening to the piano player play, um, Christmas tunes, right. You know what I mean? You just go, man, I forgot how beautiful those, uh, melodies are, you know, you get inspired to try to write melodies that are that direct, that clear. And, um, you just don't make the mistake of thinking that the music is coming from you. Just consider it coming through you, you know, mm -hmm. and all you are is a filter. Right. Know? And that really makes it easier. Right, right. So do you write on bass? Do you write on piano? Or how do you get the music out? Um, you can tell if you listen to the different songs where it started, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, anything that's melodic and, and has uh, any harmony, I write mostly from the piano. The piano is the orchestra. The piano has melody, harmony, rhythm, and bass. So it has all the elements. Mm -hmm. you know, so you can kind of really get a sense of what you're coming up with unless you come up with a cool bass line first, you know? <laughs> and then you roll with that and you and then you kind of build it from that. So um, I encourage everybody to, to learn the piano or at least learn the guitar, an mm -hmm. instrument that's polyphonic, an instrument that you can get a sense of where you're going. Right. 
Right. A big part of what you do, uh, particularly with your own music, of course, is the, is the groove that drives everything. And I was watching you, I had the pleasure of sitting and watching you play quite a bit this morning as we were doing videos and things, and your left foot's always going. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you perceive the groove. How do you think about it, and how can somebody develop a stronger sense of groove? Dance. If you're not dancing, then you don't really connect the rhythm to your body, you know? And when you're dancing, and it doesn't mean you have to be a great dancer, but if you're just out there, you know, moving to music, it's very clear what works and what doesn't work, you know? It's not like guesswork. It's like, ooh, that, you know. Like I've had drummers and said to myself, oh, he never played for a dance. <laughs> he never had the responsibility of keeping the party going. You know, yeah, because he's doing things that are interrupting the groove and doing things that in my neighborhood would have got him hurt really bad. You know what I mean? When, when I was coming up, we played, <laughs> you know, and we were, man, we were playing an hour set and then the DJ would come on for an hour. So, you know, if you're not coming with it, the DJ was kicking your butt, you know, because the DJ's playing hits after hits. He knows exactly what people like and he has no artistic pretensions, mm -hmm. right? All his job is is to keep the party going. So as a band, you know, we were trying to keep our gig. So we had to keep the party going and do stuff that the DJ couldn't do. Like, you know, move around, create some excitement, you know? So if you do that, or at least you at least sit in a club and just see what the atmosphere is and right. what, what the responsibility is, you know? Because I think music's primary function was to unite the community. Mm -hmm. That's what it's been for before any other service that it provided was to keep the community united. Everybody getting together and singing the same song. Everybody getting together and dancing the same dance. That's one of the most important roles of music. That doesn't mean you have to do it, but if you're talking about groove, you better recognize it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you recommend uh, a lot of uh, people today practice along with backing tracks or, or uh, some people recommend metronome or a drum machine. Do you recommend any of those as a, as a way to uh, solidify your groove? Yeah, all of that. Yeah. You know, there's nothing that's going to mess your groove up that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, metronome, uh, because a lot of people, uh, a lot of young musicians rush, a lot of musicians rush, especially if the part you're playing has space in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they can't wait. You know, they, they, they get nervous during the silence. Silence makes them uncomfortable. But if you play bass, man, you got to let that thing wait and, and come back in when it's supposed to. Right. You can't be afraid of those spaces, you know. Man, you listen to Bootsy's bass lines, they got beautiful spaces in them, you know. And playing with a metronome or playing with a, a loop or playing with a drummer, you know, will allow you not to be nervous about the space. Right. Because at least there's something else happening during the space. So groove is like a, a real cultural thing, you know. Um, there's so many different ways to groove. The one thing I think that's universal is that whatever happens that's cool needs to happen over and over again. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's one of the main um, components of it because something that has repetition makes it not just a one-time event. A groove is... A musical groove is like looking at a painting, right? You can stand in front of a painting for hours just looking at it, and you can start to appreciate this about the painting, then that about the painting. With a groove, it keeps coming around, you know, so you can start to appreciate different things about the groove as it comes around, as opposed to just playing stuff and then playing something else and playing something else. You know, the painting, it's like the painting just went by you, and you don't get a chance to see it anymore. That's awesome. All kinds of things to think about there, great wisdom. So uh, uh, we're we're running out of time for this interview. I wish we had all day to, to sit and talk about things. But, uh, man, uh, I got to ask you one last thing, mm -hmm. and that is what makes a great musician? You've, uh, you've played with the cream of the crop. You are the cream of the crop. Tell us your thoughts. You know, uh, Bob Skaggs said to me, people are attracted to style, right? So you have a lot of musicians who are technically really tremendously gifted, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially these days on social media. You know, you can show how cool you are for 30 seconds, you know, with all the, your, your, your technicality. But in the end, uh, you have to make people feel something. And there's different ways to make people feel something. You can make them feel something with your technique, which is sometimes very hard. The yeah. only thing they're really going to feel most of the time is, wow, 
he's really talented. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? But there's nothing that they're feeling about themselves. And that's why the musicians who play a whole lot of notes don't really understand why somebody um, who's just singing a simple melody can affect people. But that simple melody is making people look inside. It's making them feel stuff. It's making them remember things about their life, appreciate things about their life, express things, you know. So I think your style, uh, whatever you can convey about yourself, you know, we have the three-note rule. You hear, body sing, you hear somebody sing in three notes, you know who it is. Yeah. Then you're on your way. Right. You know? And that's, uh, that's hard to find because we grow up emulating our heroes. At a certain point, you have to detach from your heroes. And some people ne never can. It's right. not, not easy to do. You know, and find yourself because there's nothing really exciting about yourself. There's nothing exciting about the guy you see in the, in the mirror. It's just it's just you. <laughs> so right. How much value is that going to have? Yeah, right. But you have to realize that, you know, there is value there. Yeah. And so you got to figure out where you're from, use your culture, use your influences, use where you came from, use what you've heard growing up to create your own thing. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Definitely not easy. And, and uh, man, the aspect of mastering simplicity yeah. is uh, almost sounds oxymoronic, but it, it's a... Uh, one of those no, things people, that so many musicians, difficult. they don't get it. Nobody gets it. And I, I understand. But, man, I played bass for Roberta Flack, okay? And a lot of people don't know who she is now. But, man, let me tell you, she sang songs that were so beautifully clear. Mm -hmm. and it's about clarity more than simplicity because simplicity has a, a, a negative connotation to it. But it's just clarity. You know what I mean? It's uh, you, you hear every word. You understand the emotion of every line, you know? And I would watch the audience because I was playing bass. I was playing whole notes the whole night. <laughs> so I could watch the audience, man. And I just see people reach for the, somebody's hand, you know, just feeling stuff. Then I played for Miles, who could do the same thing with a trumpet. And then, you know, I was working with Luther Vandross. We were producing his music, and he was doing the same thing. Yeah. You know? So I got a really good education. And that's not to say I don't play a lot of notes all the time, but I recognize or I choose my spots. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the key. And man, the whole legacy of, of uh, tracks that you've worked on or as you performed it's certainly a, a great resource for someone to go back and check out to get all of that out of the out of the like I say from the legacy of of the masters. So fantastic. Man, just listen to Bill Withers. I didn't. I only played on a couple of Bill Withers records, but just listen to him. Yeah. You know, limited vocal range, but it's all in the message. You know, it's all in the feeling that you got when you listened to his music. Right. Man, so much wisdom. Such a pleasure to have you here, man. Nice to be here, man. Yeah, I hope you'll come back, uh, come back soon, and and you we'll should do see some more Mitch's videos. office, man. He's got <laughs> guitars hanging on the walls, man. He's got he's got some cool pictures of rhinoceros, rhinoceri <laughs> <laughs> with wings. Yeah, you know you gotta have a, gotta have it's, a little vibe. It's right? pretty vibey in here, man. <laughs> <laughs> my signed poster of Alan Holdsworth is one of my, my favorites. Oh, yeah, so that's it's the, awesome, man. Yeah, you know. It's awesome. Fun stuff. Got to surround yourself with fun stuff, create the environment. Mm -hmm. Man, it's so great to have you have you here, and uh, the Sire Bases are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great partnership there. I recommend everybody check those out. There's always new things coming. Yes. Yeah, we've, we've got videos I'll be posting soon, so. All right, man. Thanks very much. Great to All see right. you. All right, man. Thank All right, you. take care. All right, bye-bye. I hope that you enjoyed this installment of the Plugged In Podcast by Sweetwater as much as I did. Special thanks to Marcus Miller for sitting down with me for this interview. We had a great time having Marcus visit us here at Sweetwater, and you definitely must check out all of the amazing music he's been part of creating as a bassist, composer, and producer. He's certainly earned the title of musical legend. Now you can learn more about all of Marcus's incredible signature basses from Sire by pointing your browser over to Sweetwater.com, or better yet, reach out to your Sweetwater sales engineer for full information on these amazing instruments. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Mitch Gallagher, and this has been the Plugged In Podcast by Sweetwater. Sweetwater.